Hello and welcome to the 10th anniversary conference of Sporting Memories. 10th anniversary conference is the 10th anniversary uh, of of the, the foundation of the charity. It's only our third conference. Uh, we were very lucky to have a live conference in 2019 uh, uh, thanks to a legacy donation from the family of, of Harry Ross. Last year, if you remember in December, we went on Zoom and, and here we are on Zoom again. So uh, we've got a long and very interesting programme in front of you. I hope you'll enjoy it all. Uh, and if I sound a bit like a schoolmaster, uh, which was one of my careers from time to time, is because we've got to talk you through some of the, we call them housekeeping rules or whatever you like, uh, just to enable you to get the best out of this, this particular conference. Um, we cannot see or hear any everyone, so you know, there's no need to mute. Chat function is available for questions and comments and, you know, please use it. We've got some, some great talkers here who'd love to talk about anything you want to, to raise. Uh, the chat function is available for questions and comments and please use it. We'll be having a look at them midway through, so please feel to ask at any time. Um, as I said earlier, this conference today marks a very special 10th anniversary because on October the 14th, 2011 in the Whiskey Society, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society in Edinburgh, this charity came into being with uh, our founders Chris Wilkins and Tony Jameson Allen uh, registering it in Companies House as a community interest company followed by a charity commission a little while later. You might think it's an unusual place to register a charity, a, a whiskey company, uh, and I suppose if we were being thoroughly uh, up to date and politically correct, I should say, remember to drink responsibly, do not serve alcohol to youngsters and all that sort of thing. But like the whiskey, the, Scott, the, the Sporting Memories Foundation has matured extremely well in the years. We'll be hearing a lot more about the key milestones over the last 10 years. And more importantly, we'll be looking ahead to the next 10 years too and finding out what plans are afoot for the, for the future. We'll be sharing some special memories from friends, partners uh, and clubs, as well as a few celebrities throughout the morning. Here's one from TalkSport presenter Faye Carruthers, and I've got to read this one out. Happy 10th birthday, Sporting Memories. Thank you for everything you do using the power of sport to tackle loneliness and isolation. Sport connects so many of us and your work is crucial making sure people feel part of something special. Here's to the next 10 years and beyond. Can't say fairer than that. Another point to mention, if you'd like to donate to do so, please do it by you texting SMF to 70085 to donate £5. Text will cost the donation amount plus one standard network rate message and all donations will go directly to supporting our work. The theme of today's conference is uniting people through sport. And it's something that's so special and embraced by us all at Sporting Memories because we fully understand the power and impact of talking about and participating in sport. And just to start us off, it would be great to know where you are joining us from today. So please use your keyboard to tell us where you are. We'll be Mars, Mars, fair play. Well done. That must be William Shatner, Edinburgh, York in England and Leeds UK so far. I'm sure we'll get other messages coming through, but welcome to you all. We've got some very special guests today with strong connections of with experiences of dementia or isolation. Uh, but Edinburgh has come up, Auckland, New Zealand. Wow, we're at Suffolk. Great stuff. We jo we're joining more from Leeds. That's terrific. Uh, the idea, of course, is sport is bring Staffordshire, Coventry. Wow, every from everywhere. The idea of sport is bringing people together, bringing people together from all over the UK, all over the world because of that shared passion we have for sport and sharing that passion with us today we've got some very special guests Dame Catherine Jane Granger 
dame of the British Empire. She'll be joining us. Rob Waddell from New Zealand. Dr. Michael Clark, Guy Mowbray, the, the the sports commentator, Paul Hawksby from TalkSport, Eleanor Oldroyd, one of my old colleagues from the BBC, and the founder, Chris Wilkins. And of course, all of you are sporting clubs, members and volunteers. So welcome to all. Uh, we've got a video message from the chairman of the Sporting Memories Foundation in England and Wales, Rory McCormick. Hi everyone, I remember my very first day um, getting involved in the Sporting Memories family uh, five years ago meeting Tony in London. Um, I'm delighted to have kind of been involved in the, uh, the foundation for the last five years and I'd like to wish everyone a very happy anniversary. All the best to Sporting Memories. And the assistant uh, chief executive of the PFA who we formed a very strong partnership with, Simon Barker, also sends this message. Hi, it's Simon Barker from the Professional Footballers Association. Everybody at the PFA wishes everybody at Sporting Memories a happy 10th anniversary. Sorry we can't be with you today, but hope you have a great conference. Cheers, bye. Yeah, as I mentioned, the PFA have, have embraced Sporting Memories with a, a special group for, for former players. And it's the formation of these groups around the country that that are really matter and driving this this thing through, forward. Uh, I was very lucky, very lucky to to be part of uh, to be one of the founding members of the Brighton uh, chapter of Sporting Memories. Uh, a good friend of mine, Thurston Bassett, uh, responded to one of my earlier emails, and we got together and we launched the Brighton Club uh, in July. We've had one or two Zoom meetings, but now we're meeting online, just as I imagine the rest of you are starting to emerge from. Uh, the hibernation of, of being forced to isolate and stay Zooming and online. But actually, there's no real substitute for be meeting face to face and sharing those memories. So that's what we want to do. That's what we want to continue to do. And today we're very, very lucky to be joined by uh, our special guest, the former British rower and current chair of UK Sport. She's a 2012 Summer Olympics gold medalist. She's a four-time Olympic silver medalist and six times world champion. She served as Chancellor of Brooks University between 2015 and 2020. She's currently Chancellor of Glasgow University. I'm delighted to introduce Dame Catherine Jane Granger, DBE. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for, for all your support in the past. It's great to see you. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. And like everyone has said in the videos and everything so far, it's just, it's a wonderful thing to be part of and, and a great charity to support. So it's been my pleasure. Thank you. And I was lucky enough to, to share a conversation with you uh, earlier this year, which I hope is now on the, on the Sporting Memories website. And it was, it was just a, a great pleasure uh, for me to share those memories with you of, of your sporting career. Uh, since then, though, you've been off to the Olympics and the Paralympics. Um, explain to me the experience. What what did you get from it? Yeah, well, as you said earlier in the intro, um, uh, I've had a long career. I had 20 years as, as being an Olympic athlete, and then I was very lucky to be successful in applying for the role of chair of UK sport. And that's the, it's a basically, it's an arm's length government body. It's a British body that, that uh, invests in our, all our Olympic and Paralympic sports and also in some major sporting events. So it's really the idea behind that investment is all about um, maximizing sort of public money to make sure that we can make sport part of people's lives, relevant, inspire people, unite people, connect people, and all those things that we, we know sport can do so brilliantly. This year of all years, a bit like you've said, everyone is doing everything virtually. Uh, you know, sport almost effectively stopped in the UK in, in 2020 because of the pandemic. It meant that all our athletes um, were kind of disbanded, had to go at home, had to sort of try and one, first of all, feel safe and be safe and look after themselves and their families, but then also try to get back to some level of training, some level of competition um, as and when it was allowed. And travel was very restricted for a long time, as we know. So it meant that leading into the, the Tokyo Olympics, Tokyo Paralympics, when we knew that they were back on, um, it, it was kind of a, a very uncertain time, as it was for everyone. No one quite knew what what form it would take, what it would be like, what 
what the you know what our own teams would be like, what the international teams would be like, what the actual event would be. Um, and for a long time, we didn't think anyone, any of us, so sort of support team would be able to travel. But we did manage to. I managed to get out for both the Olympics and the Paralympics. And I have to say, it was an enormous enormous privilege to be there um it felt like such a i mean i'm hoping a very unique games um i hopefully we won't see the like again um you know no crowds obviously permitted uh so it was very intimate it felt like you could be very close to the to the athletes close to the action um in these kind of quite ghostly empty stadiums especially the, the big the big sort of say track and field could have been eighty thousand people packed out and there was a you know couple of hundred if that maybe less um depending on which teams could be there to support so it was it was a very unusual experience but um i think what was wonderful is it, it still mattered so much to the athletes it still so mattered so much to people watching at home the saddest thing was obviously the japanese people didn't get to experience the joys of a of hosting such a brilliant event um and that 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 will be the strongest thing i think, think we're left with is that country didn't really get to experience what they should have um but I think, you know, from a sporting point of view, it was a, it was a huge success. We saw some incredible moments yet again. And I think, you know, especially when the, the Olympics began and we saw Naomi Osaka kind of light the cauldron and there was this real sense that this is actually happening. This is, we, it's quite a, a sort of success of humanity to make, to make a huge global event like that happen in the middle of a huge challenging time for almost every country on this planet. So. It was very uplifting and very upbeat and hopefully created a lot more memories that people will remember for a long time to come. Yeah, certainly we do. Uh, from a competitor's point of view, and, you, and you've competed in so many Olympics, you know, the Olympics is, you know, it's a no brainer. You've got to take part in it. You've trained for it for four years or longer. Uh, and, you know, it's the pinnacle of your of your sporting career. So the, the athletes, of course, would have been desperate for the event to go ahead. Was there any reluctance among the administrators because you know it's a huge responsibility to carry isn't it to put the games on so was there a, a sense of greater reluctance amongst the administrators and was there a, a worry that it might all go horribly wrong um i think when you when anyone's hosting or putting on or supporting any of these huge events i mean even small events the always worry is what's going to go wrong i think you know the reality is something along the lines will go wrong and, and i think when you're dealing with something that is as big as a, a sort of international pandemic, then there's a lot of things that could go wrong and not just, just go wrong and be a problem, but go wrong and be quite disastrous. So I think there was nervousness for sure. Um, but I think everyone I spoke to, everyone who was involved in decision making, were very clear that there would be, you know, all the risks would be minimised, all the risks would be, you could think of, would be sort of talked through, analysed, detailed, what's the way you can reduce any any chance of things going wrong any risk of people getting ill you know what what's whether it was um how people traveled to the event how people were, were going to be tested before the event when they arrived all the i mean there's huge amounts of i mean travels just like this now huge amounts of form filling before you went across to japan um and the the big priority for all of us and, and you know, we're all in performance sport we want to see great success athletes want that as much as anyone um yet this was the games that for the the the, the biggest priority was was health and well-being and the most important thing was that every athlete who wanted to travel could travel could compete and then could come home safely um, and I'm really pleased to say that because of huge amounts of planning and preparation done in advance every British athlete that traveled and could compete managed to compete and that was that was the first sort of that was the first bit of success we're often talked about you know how many medals or how many you know what what does success mean? For these games, it was going to be people could go, could compete and come back safely. And that was managed. Um, but yeah, there was definitely nervousness, I think. And I think what's interesting now is, although it, it was a huge success, especially especially for Team GB and Paralympics GB, I think we're now seeing um, how much kind of stress was behind the scenes. A lot of the, the coaching staff, the support staff, the people who organise the teams, people making big decisions, you can see now kind of the the relief that has come with it and the kind of, you almost need everyone to go through a bit of decompression. You know, I think we underestimated the the 18 months leading up to the Games, kind of the emotional toll that can take. Um, and even with a huge success, I tell, gosh, that was, that was a hard time for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I think the, the nervousness that thankfully didn't come 
the the things that might have gone wrong didn't go wrong so i think that that was brilliant but it doesn't mean it didn't still it wasn't a stressful time for people so i think we can celebrate the success that it was and still acknowledge you know it still takes a bit of time to to kind of accept it's behind us now and we're in a good place and the absence of crowds you you mentioned that from a competitor's point of view in a way it's like the purity of sport is that you know why you do it in the first place is to take part to test yourself against your competitors so in that sense a crowd is necessary but you know we're all used to big crowds and i'm sure you'll agree competitors perform better when there's a crowd is is that how you saw it um yeah i think from an athlete point of view when they made the decision they did make the decision you know a few months before that there'd be no crowds and the first the first level of decision making was there'd be no international crowds there'd be no traveling crowds so i think athletes found out quite early on that their friends and family wouldn't be there and that's quite hard you know that is especially if you if you're an olympic or paralympic sport once every four years you get the chance to be on on that sort of that platform that that incredible event that is so special to us all um and suddenly your family couldn't be there. The people who get you through every day and every, you know, all the all the moments that the public don't see when it's just hard and training is hard and competition is hard and selection is hard. And you're, it's often your family, your, your close friends that will get you through those days. And the lovely thing is to have them there when the big moment happens. And obviously that wasn't going to be allowed. Then the, the final step for Japan was to say that actually no, even no domestic crowds, even no Japanese supporters would be possible. And that's when it becomes very nation to accept they won't be part of this event either um but i think speaking to the athletes that that from our team certainly when it got closer i think we all felt immensely sorry they wouldn't have the full games experience we're used to seeing but there was a sense from all the athletes i spoke to that this will still be better than nothing because the next stage could have been the whole cancellation of the event and i think when you have trained for four and now five years because of the extra year delay the thought that it might go completely was possible and was was you know the kind of worst case scenario for most athletes so yes the, the lack of crowds was a huge disappointment but it was still better going in and competing in front of nobody than not competing at all so i think the the athletes and, and i spoke to a lot of different international athletes there the overwhelming sense was of gratitude that the, that the event had gone ahead that japan was still willing to host and they could still compete um, so yes, the crowds are, is a huge, it's just sad, you know, when you watch the clips and the videos and things, you, the, the, the crowd are so much part of that event, so much part of the atmosphere and the attitude and the spirit of those games. So not to see the packed out stadiums that were, they were beautiful stadiums, beautiful venues, incredibly well sort of built and created and put together and yet they were, they will now remain empty and that, that's, that's a real sadness that comes with part of what this summer was. Um, but the athletes still put on an incredible show, even in the empty stadiums, and they missed the crowd, but they didn't need the crowd, which was incredible. And I think the most impressive thing for me was Japan as a nation did extraordinarily well in the Olympic Games. And we always sort of say the host nation does well because of the home crowds. And Japan sort of proved they, they could have done even better with the home crowds, but they certainly didn't need it to put on a brilliant show. So that's something they should be very, very proud of. And another thing I felt was missing, which athletes can understand, I suppose, is the fraternisation. I, mean, I haven't taken part in the Olympics, but you know, when you play against other internationals and that sort of thing, you you share a bond with them, don't you? And you have lots of points of reference and things in common that you can share. Obviously, I mean, you know, we we hear tales of the Olympics Village and so on, which you know sounds like a wonderful place to spend some time in with all of these great athletes around that would have been denied this lot of, of athletes how special is is that as a as a feeling when you're at olympics completely right about what the the bits that's missing is what sort of stood out and i think it's twofold i think these events are so rare they are you know as we keep saying every four years and so you don't get many shots at it and the thing that makes it so unique and so different and so special is um the 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 scale so it's a full you know over 200 countries come together so that the international blend is incredible but also um as a as a, so i was obviously as you mentioned a, a rower you know i'm used to being with a rowing team day in day out for months and years at, at a time once every four years you come together as part of team gb and you become 
you know, one of many, many sports that, that link together at games time. And that feels very special. That feels very different. And that means, you know, you are connected by marching in the same kit behind the same flag. And suddenly you get to meet your own teammates from, but from all these different sports you might not normally get to speak and, and, and spend time with. So there's this mix of the sports mingling and meeting and, and sharing time together, but also the every country in the nation sort of spending time together and mingling and, and just sharing, sharing experiences and stories. And that makes it so, so special. And the saddest thing was at these games, the international mixing was reduced to an absolute minimum, you know, only at competition time. You couldn't spend time with other countries otherwise. And actually, even within your own team, you were you were restricted to the sort of the smallest bubble possible. So your own teammates, because it was also a real fear of, you know, if if anybody was to get a positive test, then it would mean a lot of people would, would be isolated because of any connection. So there was a real, you know, mix with a few people as possible, even from your own nation and even within your own sport. So, you know, that's a sadness. You know, as I said, the, the basic thing that had to go ahead was the competition was still important and that could happen and that was brilliant. And that was, that going ahead meant it was still a success, but every extra bit that means it is as special as we all know it, had to be stripped away for necessity and that that's a bit sad but I think you know I think athletes I've spoken to again who had been through it I think they do they do like I said they, they are very grateful it went ahead they do feel they were a part of a unique moment in history hopefully it will not be the same when they go back and compete in Paris three years time and I think there's a real sense of the most overwhelming how many people want to go on to Paris to almost have a different games experience and and to have experience Tokyo and be even more appreciative of, of how lucky we are to be part of this world, part of sport in our life. And and even when it's the most minimal type of Olympics and Paralympics, it's still phenomenally special. And I think the excitement now building to Paris will be huge because of that. That's brilliant. Um, we're doing our bit for sporting fraternisation um, by introducing, by bringing in a special guest from New Zealand, who I, I know you know. Um, Rob Waddell is joining us especially from New Zealand at a great late late time of the hour uh, and just to talk to you about him Rob capped his career as another row he capped his career with Olympic gold medal in Sydney in 2000 and for the last year he's been New Zealand's chef de mission which I think the accent is more on the mission and less on the chefing uh, part of that championing the needs of, of athletes with uh, in the in, in the elite level in the games environments uh, his job, obviously, to ensure that New Zealand athletes gave their best. And he comes, Rob, you come from a special sporting event or, or you've got a, a sporting announcement about Sporting Memories New Zealand for us. Yeah, well, delight. Uh, good evening. Good morning, everybody. We're uh, 12 hours ahead or behind of you. <laughs> uh, but uh, we're delighted to announce that uh, the charity has been launched in New Zealand today and there's been celebrations around that. So great timing with your 10th anniversary and uh, pleased to be involved with uh, the function tonight. And the para the Olympics you, you attended as New Zealand chef de mission. How happy were you with the, the games themselves and the performance of New Zealand? Your hi, Dame Catherine. Nice to see you from afar. Um, and she, Good to she's see you, articulated Rob. some of the, some of those experiences very, very well. Uh, look, it was uh, certainly an emotional roller coaster. Uh, I think the unique thing about these games is so much of the work that was done before and in the lead up to enabled it to happen. But it was a pretty traumatic six months to a year beforehand for athletes and coaches and managers and administrators alike. Firstly, the uncertainty about whether the games are going to happen or not, and then the strain that put on people's lives. Um, but then the actual process of getting people into the country. And I think Kath and I articulated that really well, that you know, the, the, the number one priority for us is to get everyone there and back safely. And we were very concerned about the risk for our team, for our people. It is the absolute worst nightmare to think that you, know, someone, you might have to leave someone behind because they're ill. Uh, but all those scenarios go through go through our, our planning and um, we're, we're very, very grateful and pleased for all of those that uh, that helped and, and got us there and, and the support of the New Zealand government and all the sports that um, bought into what we were trying to do. And um, yeah, the medals after that really are a bonus. So quite a uh, bizarre game, it's a very unique experience. And as Catherine said, your mind struggles to compute when you go into these fantastic arenas, into these incredible stadiums and you're watching some of the 
the greatest feats in sporting history and there's no one there so it takes a little bit of getting used to but uh, we uh we, overall uh, the japanese were incredible so uh, so gracious so unselfish what they did um can't speak highly enough about what they gave to the rest of the world and enabling this to happen great to see you both and and two rowers together um when rugby players get together, we always have some things in common. What do you talk about when you when rowers get together? What do you talk about, <laughs> Catherine? What's your, how's your irk score these days, Catherine? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I would confess to in public. Uh, yeah, we normally talk about things that again we wouldn't talk about in public. The um, uh, do you know what I think? We're I think we're so we are so lucky. You know, Rob and I have shared a couple of games together, and. Um, Although it's like it's like every sport, to be honest, you know, on the field of play is just ferociously competitive. Those are you know, the Olympics are the ones that everybody wants. They are the titles that, you know, are most sought after. And yet away from the water for us, away from the field of play, it is such a family. You know, it's, these are these are you know, the best people in the world coming together to to fight for the glory. And yet there's something so much more than that that you gain from it. The friendships that go on forever. You know, Rob and I haven't seen each other forever. And yet we could we could. We could chat for hours. We could bore everyone senselessly about the old times, and I think that's what sport is such a. It's such a gift. It is these, these experiences that you share, the friendships you forge, the places you go, the memories you have. They are just priceless, and we we talk about yeah everything that we probably shouldn't together. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, your your feeling when you, I mean New Zealand is a strange country in a way that rugby is so so dominant. Uh, particularly in the public perception from our point of view. Do rowers feel part of that? or do you, I mean, how do you relate to the rugby in New Zealand? You know, rugby is a very uh, dominant code amongst our community. I think probably as much in participation um, and consumption as how you might look at the different sports. So from a consumption point of view, a lot of people watch rugby. It has a huge following. But as far as participation goes, you know, there's other sports that are, are right up there. Netball, basketball, um, volleyball, uh, water polo. These are all sports that are climbing through the ranks, partic particularly at a secondary school level. And I think it shows the diversity and the changing nature of our culture and all the, the different people and personalities that now make up New Zealand. So it's wonderful to see people active, whatever they're doing. And I think uh, right around the world, we face that challenge of how we get people engaged with sport. And uh, there's all sorts of positive initiatives that are happening in that space. Um, we look to the UK too for their leadership and some of the, the great things that I've done to uh, help get their people uh, engaged in sport and participating. Um, but we, yeah, I think there's a real commonality there amongst what we all share together. We've always looked up and admired what the uh, what the GB or UK teams do when we're competing or training together. So um, in terms of reminiscing and looking back on some of the, uh, the, the, the competitions we've been at together, those are pretty fond memories and um, lots of positive friendships made through those times. And a question for you both, I suppose, is you mentioned, uh, Catherine, that the standard of the games, the dedication of the athletes, the sheer ability is rising still. And so we see these absolute superstar athletes out there on the field and maybe to the ordinary person that's how can i possibly emulate that begin to compete with that be in the same human race as some of these extraordinary athletes and yet we we all know that sport is very important and rob just mentioned that it's important to get people involved in sport when the elite goes that far away how do you cater with and encourage the the ordinary Joe Joes of the public like us. I think one of the lovely things is the you know Rob and I have both spent a lot of time in among this this sort of this high performing world. Um, and I you know I was the same when I was at school when I was a you know growing up. You you had these incredible athletes on these incredible pedestals, and I think the most wonderful thing is when you spend time with them is they are. They do absolutely extraordinary things, but most people, most elite athletes I know that are in the teams and have done incredible performances, would all, you know, are all there's a real humility that comes with it. They really will point out all the things they're not very good at and the things that they're, you know, they took a long time to get and all the mm. all the times they failed as much as succeeded. And I think um, 
you know, I think it is hard because I think we have this distance because it's it's like with any, you know, whether it's in, in sport or in art or in different bits of culture, we, we put people on huge pedestals because of exceptional performances that we see and think we're so different from that. But actually they all started from nothing and they all start the things they're good at and things they're not good at and there's a real there's a real humanity there that we don't always recognize in in the right way you know we we should no one started off on day one of doing their sport thinking they'd be you know olympic champion and it's a long long process to get there which is brilliant now that doesn't mean that everyone should then necessarily want to or sign up to aiming to try and get to be, become an olympic champion but if they want to i'd recommend it it's very good but you know there's something that that we've all we've all got from our sport as well as the successes is, as we've just talked about, the friendships and the fun and the health aspect. And, you know, I think we've really recognized during the last period of lockdown, how just getting out and getting some fresh air, getting some company is really good for our, our well-being and ourselves as much as anything else. So, you know, for the people who think, gosh, I could never do what they do because they're, you know, wonderful Olympians. Well, actually we get, we get the same as everyone gets from it. We get the same fun and enjoyment and, and fresh air and, and health that other people do. And I think that's very accessible to everyone. And whether you want to go on and take on the world or whether you just want to go on and take on your neighbour, that's all good. Rob, same problems in New Zealand that the, the superstars are on a pedestal and the ordinary people say it's not for us. I don't, I don't get that impression having visited New Zealand. It's a very open air, can do, physically active, active place from my experience. Uh, how do you find it? Do you find there's a difficulty in bridging that gap? Well, I think uh, when you when you've competed at the at the high level of Olympic Games, you do appreciate that it, it is uh, it is all the same pressures and anxieties that you might normally expect. I think there's a perception that athletes have got some incredible way of dealing with all of this, and there's a magic wand out there. But the reality is, you're just as nervous and anxious as. Uh, as, as you might expect. I think the difference obviously is you're, you're in an environment where you're supported and helped and you've got some really good training and processes in and around that. But uh, yeah, I think back for me personally, some of my most uh, satisfying achievements were in my earliest days of competing in the sport when I was at school, when I made the, the top crew at my school for the first time or when I pulled an erg score that I'd you know, for a goal or target that I'd set. So I think it's relative at any level and no matter where you are in the, in the hierarchy of sporting achievement, um, you can experience that same sense of joy, that same sense of satisfaction. I think it's something really wonderful about, about sport that we, um, that we all enjoy. It's, uh, you don't have to be an Olympian. It's uh, something you can enjoy all the way through. And to your question before about New Zealand, I think New Zealanders generally are sport uh, fanatics. They do love sport. It's maybe something to do with our our small population size and our isolation that we're trying to prove to the rest of the world that we're, we're worthy of being involved. Um, so we do tend to, to fight pretty hard in that space. But the Olympics have been tremendously well received recently. And to your question about the All Blacks, yes, the All Blacks are very prolific, uh, but equally the Olympics get a lot of respect as well. And, uh, you know, if events like that were happening, um, you know, week in, week out, and uh, they happened every year, I think you'd probably find there was more recognition of those teams, but obviously our world champs tend to be a bit further apart, and um, the Olympic Games every four years. But, yeah, we, we do love sport in our country, and it's a big part of uh, what we try and do and how our country comes together. Yeah, and it's all about get, encouraging as many people, whatever the age, whatever their... Uh, wherever they come from to get involved in in sport or at least in exercise and that applies to, to many of our or sporting memories members you know who are towards the end of our lives and later older than we might be uh, exercise is still vitally important and, and I'm sure that's that's the message from both of you but we have had a few questions from the audience and I hope if the magic of technology brings this up I can read them one from Kelly, great news, New Zealand. Welcome officially to the Sporting Memories family. A message from Anonymous, Dame Catherine, great role model for young athletes, inspirational. And a question for Catherine, who was your sporting hero that inspired you to get involved in sport? Gosh, it's a good question. I don't know if I had one, if I'm honest. Um, I remember when I was at school before I, I mean, I loved watching the Olympics. Um, growing up and but never never thought it would be me I just really loved it and then when I was at school actually I got really into martial arts and um, 
and I, and I and my first my first one was probably Bruce Lee, who is a legend of martial arts. Um, but beyond, I think what I loved about him, and actually I probably grew more to appreciate it, was his understanding of um, as much as he wanted to have this incredible control of of his physical body, which you do need to have in all sports, especially martial arts. But how important the mindset behind it is, how important, you know, being able to um, ha have sort of not as a control, but understanding of the, your way of thinking and your what is possible through um, just this real belief in special things coming together, whether it's, you know, mind, body, physicality and spirituality and all the rest. And he had this incredible way of constant learning, constant picking up from all the, from nature and from other sports and everything else. And I love that sense of curiosity he had. So actually he probably inspired me in more ways than I thought at the time. Um, and then when I got into my own sport in rowing at, at university, you know, I was really lucky the biggest superstars in the world at that point with Steve Redgrave was in the team and Matthew Pinsent and, and I was my first games, which was in Sydney, which was where Rob was so successful. And, they, those were incredible games um, to be part of because there just seemed so many real, uh, real historic moments happening around the Sydney Games. And I was very, very lucky to be in the opening ceremony, um, obviously marching with Team GB, when Cathy Freeman, you know, lit the cauldron in Sydney. And then I was the back in the stadium, you know, a week later when she competed in and won the 400 meter um, and it was, she was such an icon of those games and so much pressure and expectation. A bit like Rob talked about that anxiety and nerves is there, however good you are. She was absolutely the favourite to win. But she had this pressure of, you know, also being the person who could unite a, a divided nation in mm -hmm. Australia because she was an Aboriginal figure. So you know, there's so many, I think I get inspired easily and in a good way uh, by by people because of the, what they do, what they achieve, but also the, the people they are, the kind of behaviours they show and I, I hope, I kind of hope I always feel that way. I hope I always kind of look to more and more people to, to I think you can find inspiration in a lot of places and that's, I think that's a good thing to be. It's a very long answer for saying I don't Rob, really have one inspirational hero. Rob, your hero and also the question from the audience, does sport help to make the world feel more connected and reduce the feeling of distance you could have in New Zealand? Does sport help to bring you closer to the rest of the world is that a... yeah so the to the first question uh much like uh, catherine i don't think i had a particular person growing up who i sort of held as that one role model but there were a couple of great new zealanders who are pretty iconic for us that i guess as i went through my teenage years you look up to and you admire and they tend to sort of embody all the things that make you proud of who you are and where you come from and uh, a couple of those people were sir peter blake who led uh, New Zealand's challenge for the America's Cup and, and won in 1995 and defended it in 2000. Just a wonderful New Zealander and I was privileged to do three America's Cup campaigns, uh, 203, 207 and 213. And his spirit and his leadership and his charisma is very much a, a key part of the team and it's amazing how he influenced so many generations of people uh, above and below uh, with, with his actions. Just a wonderful man and a great leader. The other one would be uh, Sir Edmund Hillary. He was uh, he's our famous mountaineer, um, first man to climb to the highest peak in the world. And he was, again, just a wonderful New Zealander, very humble, down to earth, no nonsense, but spent so much of his life giving back to other people too. And I think as an athlete, that's one of the things you reflect on with with time is it, it's it's amazing to to be able to compete at this level, it's wonderful if you can achieve your dream. But I think most importantly, above all of that, it's it's who you are as a person that matters the most, how you treat other people, how you're respected by your peers, the integrity of what you bring forward. Those are pretty big values. And I know it, it's sort of my moment of truth uh, in, in Sydney when I was sitting there, when you're half an hour before the Olympic final, you know, it's one thing to be an Olympic final, it's another thing to sit there and know you're actually capable of winning it. And I always uh, reflect on thinking, you know, what was important above everything else was that I was just a good person and trying to be a good person and trying just to aspire some good basic values in life because those are things that define us. We have these these highs and lows in life, but inevitably uh, the person you are and the values you hold is a pretty big part of um, of what we aspire to, I think, for most of us. So, so that's uh, answer the first question. The second piece is there is does the world make you is the world become more connected through sport and reduce the feeling of distance? Well, we can never get round that it's always two days travel for everyone to come and visit us in New Zealand. So it's not like you can say 
why don't we catch up on Friday and have a beer <laughs> with mates in the UK? It's just a long way to come. I'm sorry about that, but uh, it's a great place to come. So please make sure you do come and join us. And I guess things like this technology enable us all to come closer. I guess sport is a universal language, right? Everyone speaks it. At some point in their life, everyone in the world has run or jumped or sprinted or thrown something. And so we can all identify with it, no matter what age and stage. Um, so I think it's uh, it's something that we all um, share and, and something that we um, respect each other with too, and um, a commonality that goes throughout every nation, every culture in the world. Brilliantly said. Thanks, Rob, and thanks Thanks, Catherine. Uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping points, I suppose. We have had some problems with the website. Obviously, it's crashed with so many people wanting to get involved and, and talk to our special guests. Mm. Uh, also, steps for sporting memories. Uh, that's a very important thing. Catherine Gange involved in that as well. Uh, we're delighted to, new, to launch a new route called, in the series called Steps for Sporting Memories, which is in partnership with the charity, which is called World Walking. The route is called Steps of Sporting Memories, UK Female Sporting Greats. And the participants in our walks can reminisce while they stay active and what we talked about, find out more about some of the great British sportswomen from the UK, names such as Mary Peters, Virginia Wade, Nicola Adams, Tanny Gray Thompson, Princess Royal, Prince, Princess Anne, and of course, Dame Catherine Granger, who's been given a sporting milestone as well as part of this virtual route. So. Do join Sporting Memories. It's a great way of meeting up with other people, walking along those and just thinking about these great inspiring sports people who have really set us up along there and given us so much joy and pleasure. The free activity can be done in home, in your home, or if, if someone has limited mobility, everyone can contribute, whether you're part of as an individual or family or group of friends at a club. There are over two and a half million steps uh, collected to put towards steps for sporting memories, UK sporting greats, female sporting greats. So remember, every step counts as a message that's been mentioned by Rob and by Catherine. Every step counts. Activity is vital. Every step counts to a healthier lifestyle. And you can get more information about this event after today. Uh, thanks very much indeed to Catherine and Rob. And we're going to move on to the next bit of our conference. There's a quick video from our friends at Kostorfin, I hope I pronounced that right, in Edinburgh. Stringing. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to the families. Happy birthday to you. I'm sure you tell me if I pronounce Korstorfin right. Always get Scottish name. No, I don't always get them wrong. Our next guest, Dr. Michael Clark, is an associate professional research fellow with the Care Policy and Evaluation Centre at the London School of Economics. I've had to read that out. I couldn't memorise it. He's worked at local, regional and national levels, undertaking and managing research. The research interests include social care, dementia care, mental health, public involvement in research and arts and other social activities and their place in care. Michael has been associated with Sporting Memories since its, its inception and he's worked with the network to evaluate and disseminate information about many aspects of its work over the last 10 years. Working with the network has helped spark many fond memories for Michael and he's also created many joyous new ones. His presentation is called Sporting Memories, 10 Years of Reminiscing, Reconnecting and Researching. Welcome, Dr. Michael Clark. Thank you, Alastair. And, and thanks to, to Rob and Catherine for that earlier opening, uh, fascinating uh, insights and memories from both of you. And I, I shall try not to let the side down with my presentation now. Um, <clears throat> it's a pleasure and a privilege to join everybody today. And special thanks to um, Chris and Susie and the team for inviting me and for making this possible. So hopefully the technology now works. There we go. <clears throat> it's um, it, it's also a, a, an absolute privilege to be presenting in this slot, celebrating the, the contribution of Norrie Gallagher to the the life of the Sporting Memories Network from its inception, the the ideas, the philosophy. 
and particularly the energy of Norrie were, were amazing in getting the momentum going for the network and, and helping to develop sporting memories as an idea. And I, I gather that uh, his, his ideas and he, his founding principles for the network are still really fundamental to the work of the network. So I'm not sure if you're out there listening, Norrie, but um, thank you from everyone involved in the network for your contribution over the 10 years. <clears throat> and 10 years, I, when Chris said to me about coming and talking today at the 10 year conference, uh, I just couldn't believe it. It, it. I couldn't believe that it was 10 years ago that uh, Chris and Tony were <clears throat> um, sitting talking to me and said, we've got this little idea and we're thinking about doing this thing using sporting memories to help unite people. And I just thought, wow, that, that's fantastic. I can't believe that, you know, it, it's not already being done widely. And um, I just said, yes, great, I'm on board. And they asked me to be involved in the network and particularly to help with thinking about research and evaluation of their work. So what I want to do in, in the next few minutes is just spend a little bit of time talking about the the work of the network in terms of reminiscing, reconnecting people, and also researching and learning the lessons from what they're doing. But also, if you'll indulge me, a little reminiscing myself about work with the network. <clears throat> and I'm just reminded that, uh, you know, very often it's the, it's the simple ideas that are the most powerful. <clears throat> and in the course of preparing this presentation today, I heard this quotation from um, somebody on, on the radio, and I just thought, oh, this, this is just seems so appropriate to this presentation and the work of the network. And it, it's from uh, somebody called Victor Borgia, who I, I had to look up, I have to confess, uh, but he's an American comedian. And he said, laughter is the shortest distance between two people. And I just thought that that is just so appropriate for today. Um, sporting memories, as a means of bringing people together to have fun, to laugh together and connecting people. And as I say, just such a simple idea, but so, so powerful in its impact. <clears throat> and right from the start, this was more than just a, a passing interest for, for me. Uh, many of you uh, may recognize this character here, Jeff Astle, the king, as his nickname goes. And he was a, a player for West Bromwich Albion and England. And West Bromwich Albion is the team that I support. And Jeff sadly died in 2002 and he had dementia. And from that time, his family have been strong campaigners for better understanding the, the impact of heading the ball and potentially causing dementia in later life. And of course, that, that concern has grown more and more in terms of head injuries in other sports. And so I, <clears throat> right from the start, I, I had a, a, a very strong interest in this connection between sport and, and Jeff Astle in particular and dementia. And when Chris asked me to, to do this talk, one of the first things I did was just to, to look at the, the website of the Sporting Memories Network <clears throat> and I just could not believe, even though I've been connected with the network, it was still amazing to see the evidence of how this fledgling idea has taken flight over 10 years from a, a really small website that did have a, a, a small memory from myself on there uh, and one or two other people that were early uh, supporters of the network to now the, the, a phenomenal range of sports. I've just taken some screen grabs there from the website. Uh, it grew from initial thoughts about particularly football, but now spans the huge array of sports. And we were just hearing, of course, about the Olympics. So not just individual sports, but uh, particular international sporting events. And of course, uh, Sporting Memories Network was involved with the uh, Commonwealth Games in, in Scotland a few years ago. <clears throat> and also then when you look within any individual sport, the fantastic array of clubs that now have memories shared on the website as a resource for everyone to, to use and, and help connect with others. And then looking again on the website across the country, there are, to use uh, the, the metaphor, there are pitches everywhere now 
on which people can come together and and join in this reconnecting and reminiscing about sport. So it's just absolutely phenomenal to see how much the the, the idea has grown in 10 years. <clears throat> and as I said, right from the start, Chris and Tony asked me to be involved in trying to uh, evaluate some of the work that they'd done. And this, back in 2015, was the first paper that we produced together with somebody called Charlie Murphy, who was also involved in uh, supporting the network and de delivering training. Uh, <clears throat> and in this, we, we looked at the lessons from the first few years of the Sporting Memories Network. And in particular, we set out the challenges around uh, people feeling potentially lonely and isolated and how depression and dementia can contribute to people becoming a, a little bit disconnected from their friends, their families, their communities, and from the, the, the sporting events that perhaps they've been involved in in much of their lives. And so this idea of people having an opportunity to reminisce and to reconnect with family and friends was, was very evident in the, the early evidence that we were pulling together. <clears throat> Then one of the, uh, the the next things that we did was a project looking at developing sporting memories groups within care homes. And in particular, we, we were interested here in, in the fact that um, a lot of men in care homes <clears throat> might feel a little bit isolated if the um, it, often they're in the minority. Uh, ladies tend to live a little bit longer. Uh, but also that they might feel a little bit disconnected from, again, that the things that they've enjoyed much of their lives and a bit isolated in these care homes. And we, we did some work with a group of care homes across Leeds that were looking to develop sporting memories groups. And this, was a, this is a particularly fond memory for me doing this piece of work because I had the opportunity to participate in some of the sporting memories training that was delivered to some of the, the staff in these care homes. And here I was sitting in, in a room in Leeds with a, a group of staff that I had no previous connection with. And within a few minutes of being given some material about sporting memories, photographs and so on, uh, there we were just having conversations and, and just connecting together and having a bit of fun within a few minutes of meeting and I think one of the, the lessons from this was also that sporting memories is, is not necessarily just about specific clubs or individuals. It's often a, a matter of social history. Even some of the people in that room that weren't especially interested in sports were, were able to, to talk and reminisce about sporting memories from school days, going to the, the swimming pool for swimming lessons and trying to sneak uh, snacks out of the vending machines, I remember somebody talking about. And another, another powerful uh, insight for me from this was somebody talking at the group uh, sparked me reminiscing about going to the Speedway with my dad <clears throat> when I was uh, a little lad. And I, I was not only reminiscing about this, in that moment I was back there, the sounds the smell of the speedway, the crowd, being with my dad. I was back there and that was just so, so powerful and such an insight to me about how sporting memories can be so powerful and beneficial to people. But one of the, 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 the challenges of working with Chris and the team is that they don't stand still. I think that's great, uh, but it can be difficult when they say, yeah, that's great, that's great. We've done the stuff on care homes. But now, now, now we're thinking about intergenerational work and we're working in community sporting groups uh, to, to look at bringing youngsters and older generations that are linked to the clubs together. Can you do some work with us on that? And this, this was a, another whole new area for me. <clears throat> so I had to go away and uh, learn quite a bit about intergenerational working and what was known about that. But again, it was just fantastic to... to see how this this initially simple idea about bringing people together can spin off in so many powerful ways, so many interesting innovations. And this idea of bringing youngsters together 
to connect with with older members of the clubs was fantastic and and some of the the lessons that we learned from this have gone on to inform uh, the way that clubs now work with with different generations in their their clubs to to use sporting memories to help inspire the youngsters and to reconnect uh, the older members of the club back with the club and with with some of the younger members of the club so again just uh, fantastic insights into the power of sporting memories <clears throat> and then of course most recently the pandemic came along and sporting memories true to its spirit uh was looking to how can we continue to innovate what can sporting memories do to respond and this idea of doing online groups quickly emerged rather than closing everything down because face-to-face -face meetings were not possible the sporting memories foundation thought can we pull together something to support people by doing online groups and by doing all of the, the evaluation and the reflecting over the years, the Sporting Memories Network was able to uh, reflect on what they'd learned from face-to-face -face groups and think about how that might work with online groups and quickly transferred the idea to, to the, these online fora that we've fairly quickly become used to. But let's not forget kind of 18 months ago, when the pandemic started to hit. This was a very new idea. And it, it's just amazing to see the Sporting Memories Network was right there drawing on its volunteer network and its members to deliver something that was very, very innovative at the time. And <clears throat> this pandemic hit just at the time when the network was looking to launch its kickbag project. So this was an idea that fit, helping uh, using sporting memories to also uh, help people to be more physically active has always been an important part of the the concept and i know in in care homes for instance people have done um um chair yoga and uh, uh carpet bowls alongside the sporting memories activities <clears throat> and the kickback idea was could you produce something that um when, when to would support people in their homes and in community groups to be more physically active through their participation in sporting memories groups so around the time of the pandemic this was obviously uh, a, a bit of a challenge but again sporting memories network rose to it they did a pilot project they discussed the idea with volunteers and participants and eventually did launch the kit bag which you can see the the photo in the bottom left there the kit bag is a, a series of, of written resources so um, a, a exercise book and um, uh, some of the sporting pins but also some physical things to help people exercise a ball uh, a squeezy ball to help people develop their grip and, and also a, an elasticated band to help people do stretches and <clears throat> the project was successfully launched and in discussion with the network um, the, the network also put together a booklet that goes in the pack and you can see a little screenshot on the right there, which is um, a logbook of people's experience of going through the week's activities with the kit bag and looking at how active they've been, what exercises they've done using the kit, but also what exercises they've done uh, in, in the rest of their lives. And the idea of this was to, to involve the participants in the group to look at how effective this approach is to trying to help people to be more active. And we're, we're, we're getting some early lessons from it. And I'm really pleased to report that 90% of the people who responded said that they strongly or agreed that they had increased confidence through using the kit bag to be more physical and in particular to move from sitting to standing. And we know that people just uh, sitting all day, as unfortunately I tend to do too often in this virtual life of mine now, uh, <clears throat> is, is really unhealthy for people. So just getting people starting to move more is a major achievement. And over the 12 week period, 81% of participants said they'd been encouraged in their lives to exercise more. This could be getting out in the garden, 
doing some gardening, walking around the local area, a whole range of things. But they, they were saying they were more encouraged now, felt more physically confident to be able to get up and do more things. And on average, people reported that they were doing 12 minutes more exercise a day, which is, which is actually a, a huge achievement. <clears throat> and that they were also uh, being more confident to try new activities. They were not only using the kit bag and not only doing things around the house that they had previously been doing, but they were getting out and about in their neighborhoods and in their gardens a little bit more. So what we're learning is that with just a little bit of equipment, some support through a group, people can become more physically active as well as enjoying the other benefits of reminiscence and sporting memories, in particular, of course, having fun together. And I think that's the, the underpinning concept here, bring people together to have fun. And you can see a whole range of physical, emotional and psychological benefits from it. And here are some, some quotations from uh, participants in the Kitbag project, just to demonstrate the, the, the personal impact that it's had on them and their families. <clears throat> and I think in particular, what some of these are showing is that yes, that they've benefited from it, they've, they're doing more exercise, they've enjoyed it, they have a laugh, um, but also this idea of it becoming uh, part of a routine in the week. I like this quotation from somebody that said, uh, they keep their equipment together in the bag so that when they're going to do the exercises, they pretend they're going to the local leisure center like they used to. And I think this idea of routine, in particular, it was something that many of us lost during the, the early part of the lockdown as we lost those regular meetings and opportunities to go out. And, and through this, these online groups and through the kit bag, um, people were able to, to rebuild some sense of structure and norm normality to their lives that, that sporting memories was giving them. And that, that is just, again, just a, another phenomenal insight into the power of uh, this sporting memories work over particularly the last 18 months with the pandemic. So what next for sporting memories and research? I think Chris is going to talk a little bit later about sporting memories uh, developments to come. But in terms of research, we're planning to complete the analysis and reporting of the kit bag work and potentially to do more work on the power of these virtual groups to connect people in lots of different ways, perhaps across a regional area, larger geographical areas, uh, maybe even including New Zealand, you never know, Rob. Uh, <clears throat> and, and through this to think about how sporting memories can be as inclusive as possible. Um, sporting memories has always had that goal of including people and now wants to work on becoming even more inclusive. And in particular, what we want to do is to continue to work together to co-produce the research, to continue to learn together. Each of the papers I mentioned there wasn't just written by me. It involved people that are involved in the network. And that's one of the, the, the fundamental things that we've tried to do through the evaluation work is to produce the work together to bring the lessons and, and the experience together. And one of the things we want to try to do is to build on the kit bag work to build a citizen science approach to this. So citizen science is that idea of involving members of the public much more in, in directing and participating in, in research. And one of the things we'd like to do is to use that citizen science approach that we've started to develop with the kit bag work to develop more evaluation of the sporting memories network. So hopefully some of you listening today will get more of a chance to be part of that citizen science approach. So in conclusion, what, what am I drawing from 10 years of making a difference through reminiscence, reconnecting and research? I've got here some lessons. I think they're, they're directed to all of us as much as to uh, sporting memories network itself. Keep innovating and active, don't stand still. And a, a, a few years ago, I, I took up this philosophy and my son started karate and uh, I, I started uh, doing karate with him. And uh, maybe Catherine can uh, vouch for me in saying that's not something that you should really do when you're middle aged. However, over the last few years, we've really enjoyed it. And uh, he particularly enjoys it now that he gets to kick the stuffing out of me every week. Uh, but we're, we're making memories. We're being active and we're making memories together. 
And I'm sure over the, the, the next few years, he'll continue to have fun attacking me. And we'll, we'll fondly remember those things in the years to come. Um, <clears throat> but I think all of us, we need to keep connecting, keep discussing things and keep having fun. And so sporting memories, thanks for today, but also thanks for all the memories over 10 years. Congratulations with all that you've achieved. And here's to the next 10 years. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Michael. Uh, I hope you'll stay around to answer some of the questions because that is what we're opening up the, the floor for now. People will get the chance now to uh, write in their questions. We've got one or two little snippets before that, but if we can have your questions coming in now, that would be, uh, be terrific. We'll use the chat facility, please, to write down any questions you have, and they'll be coming after we've spoken to Chris Wilkins, our founder. But before all of that, we've got another lovely video, this time from one of our charity partners, Dr. Judith Gates from Head for Change. Hello, I'm Dr. Judith Gates, Chair and Co-Founder of Head for Change. And it's an absolute pleasure today to wish our partner, Sporting Memories, a happy 10th birthday. We're thrilled to partner with Sporting Memories because we know the great work that they do with footballing families as well as other sporting families, with the groups that they hold and the value that that has for the family members and the players involved. Happy birthday. Great stuff and never a truer word, cooperating collaborating, using each other's expertise is so important. I've been involved in a couple of charities where you get charity wars between, you know, two MS groups, for instance, fighting over territory, when actually all you want is for people with MS to, to feel better. And the same thing has to apply to, to all the charities who, who want so much for people with dementia and isolation and loneliness and depression to have better lives and to use sport. Uh, for that benefit. We have, I think, received some questions from the audience. So I'm going to ask Drew if he can put a, few, a selection of those uh, up so we can see them. No, the questions will actually be coming after we've, we've spoken to Chris Wilkins, our founder. So in the meantime, uh, we'll have another video from Hayley McQueen, who is the Sky Sports presenter and daughter of the footballing legend, many of us remember, Gordon McQueen, and she has a special message. Hi there at Sporting Memories, wishing you a very happy birthday from this lineup at Sky Sports. How about that? Yeah, thank you so much for all that you do tackling, I guess, loneliness, dementia, Alzheimer's, everything that you do, because yeah, just watching back, reading back, old archive footage is great, keeps the mind working, doesn't it? I particularly like looking back at football from the 90s when I really got into the game. Um, but yeah, keep doing the work you're doing. Keep following Sporting Memories on Twitter and wishing you a very happy birthday. Thanks, Hayley. We've already mentioned that today is a special milestone, the 10th anniversary, a great reason to celebrate and one that is worth noting. And we've got a special report here from a Sporting Memories patron and top football commentator and top bloke, Guy Mowbray. He's got a match report of the key events and milestones from the past 10 years of Sporting Memories. Landmark moment as Sporting Memories hits 10. The team and supporters of Sporting Memories are celebrating after racking up 10 years of tackling dementia, depression and loneliness through the power of sport. It's put them in a great position to push on further, with the supporter base only likely to increase thanks to a terrific team effort based on hard work allied to a brilliant creative performance. 2011-12, the first goal. Founders and dynamos behind the project, Tony Jamieson Allen and Chris Wilkins, got the ball rolling swiftly straight from kickoff. Sporting Memories made no apologies for going Route 1 immediately, launching simultaneously in England and Scotland. The first community club and care home project then quickly opened up, with great reading of it all and the inaugural Memories match through the Sporting Pink, now being distributed all over the field weekly. 2012-13, 2 nil, and taking a hold. Sporting Memories was now getting established and took the road to gathering more support 
with the Sporting Memories Foundation becoming a registered charity and with the well-known web strategy being put to innovative new use. It was the start of the Replay Memories website. 2013-14, 3-0 with the eyes of the world taking notice. The third year brought recognition for such a powerful early performance. Sporting Memories were overall national winners of the Alzheimer Society's first dementia-friendly community awards. The team was also staking a claim for international recognition with projects around the 2014 Commonwealth Games and the Grand Depart of the Tour de France. 2014-15, 4 nil consolidation and the next step. Despite performing with such control and energy, Sporting Memories knew that even a great team gets left behind when it stands still. So it was time to make the next positive move with the launch of the Replay Reminiscence app. This was about really looking to the future, so the intergenerational website Spirit of the Games also came about. 2015-16, 5 nil, a huge moment. This was the point when several new gears were found with the introduction of a new player. Getting Reuters on board led to the donation of 90,000 sporting images to really take the project to new levels. A magnificent assist that was richly appreciated by the supporters. News quickly spread too as sporting memories featured in the BBC Five Live documentary Dementia and the Power of Sport. 2016-17 it's six. Shira! The BBC's contribution to spreading the message increased as star pundit and former England captain Alan Shearer visited a Sporting Memories Club as part of his superb BBC One documentary, Dementia, Football and Me. The energy in the whole team display was only increasing by now, with the first virtual walk taking place and the start of a new digital pink service, which was soon reaching Australia. A perfect demonstration in how to play the long ball effectively. 2017-18, seven, and only getting even stronger. The seventh year was marked by the milestone of 100 community clubs being set up and running throughout the UK, and the launch of the dedicated Scottish charity, the Sporting Memories Foundation of Scotland. All those watching on rightly admired and applauded, including the Prime Minister, who gave those pioneering co-founders Points of Light Awards, recognising outstanding individuals making a positive change in their community. 2018-19, an incredible eighth. How do you improve on a century of clubs in the UK? By spreading the play as wide as possible, with the opening of the first two Sporting Memories Clubs in Australia. And centuries were up for discussion at the first ever National Sporting Memories Conference too, after the first social licence with Sussex Cricket Foundation was established. Surely time to go back to walking pace. Well, only kind of, with the kick-off of the first SM Walking Football Club. 2019-20 on cloud nine. Or maybe not nine. Maybe we should say now. With Wales Weekend and the opening of the first clubs in Wales. Although, as a reminder that this remarkable success story is one big team effort, the first great get-together linked all the Sporting Memories nations online. This was a big feature as the world went into a pandemic force lockdown, potentially a real problem for a project based on talking and meeting. A different tactic was needed to forge on. And so online clubs and phone circles came about and the digital pinks idea was tweaked, relaunched with regional variations. Hashtag talk about sport and a whole series on talk sport radio proved super moves to get even more people talking. 2020-21, double figures and the memories will keep on being created. Reaching 10 had the added problem of another lockdown, but Sporting Memories is nothing if not creative, and brought the idea of the SM kit bag to help all those stuck inside to stay active. And just to keep on with racking up the goals, how about a formal partnership with charity partner Head for Change? Another partnership with the PFA to support former footballers, the start of Sporting Memories New Zealand, and worldwide exposure through coverage of the world's oldest cup competition, the FA Cup. It has been a fantastic 10 years of sporting memories. But we won't stop there. There are still many goals to be scored and always lots to talk about. Happy birthday, sporting memories. And happy 90th, Jim Ross, former captain of Dunfermline, 
I'm one of the founding members of our Kakodi Club. It's people like Jim who drive us forward. Brilliant stuff, Guy. Thank you so much. We'll be talking to you in just a few moments' time. But first, though, another video message, this time from the Elder Tree Sporting Memories Club in Plymouth. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Sporting oh, Memories, oh, from Plymouth! <laughs> Staying with the theme of uniting people through sport and reminiscing and talking about it, I'm delighted to be joined by some of the great broadcasters uh, and Sporting Memories patrons also, Guy Mowbray, of course, and Paul Hawksby and Eleanor Oldroyd, who's been a presenter and reporter for BBC Sport for 30 years. Eleanor began her career in local radio in the mid-1980s, covering county cricket for the Midlands at a time when females in the press box were virtually unknown. She joined BBC Radio Sport in 1991 and a year later went to her first Olympic Games, Barcelona 1992. Elias covered virtually every sport in that time, including working at 12 Olympic Games, but her first love, so we're told, is cricket. Good for you. Guy is an English football commentator who primarily appears on the BBC and BT Sport while working for Eurosport at the 1998 World Cup he became the youngest ever television commentator on a World Cup final, aged just 26. Paul Hawksby is a British radio sports radio presenter and comedy writer. He's presented the Hawksby and Jacobs show alongside Andy Jacobs on Talk Sport since the station's inception in 2000. He's also contributed to the writing of ITV's Harry Hill's TV Burp and Al Murray's Happy Hour and the original spitting image so welcome to to all of you and somebody asked what is the uh, what is the collective name for a bunch of commentators and i think probably the answer is a chatter but welcome to you all and i suppose a, a vague question for all of you how did you get involved in sport let's start with you ellie how did you first of all what what made you think this is what i want to do well, first of all, hi, Alistair. It's really great to see you and, and uh, hello, everybody as well. I, I suppose really it was just growing up in a sports mad family. I've got two brothers and my dad loved sport and it was watching it on TV. It was listening to it on the radio. I can I think that, that you know, the theme music for Out of the Blue is probably in my veins somewhere. That's the sports report theme tune, of course, for, for people who don't know at five o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. But I was trying to remember what my, my earliest sporting memory was, and it was probably the 1968 Olympic Games, um, which I remember watching on the TV at my grandparents' house. And, and then I remember the 1970 World Cup, just getting more involved each time and engaging more and more with with sport and, and the love of sport. But yeah, I, I think it was always there. And, and when I was about 15, I thought if I could find somebody who would pay me to watch cricket all day, then that would be my dream job. And um, I'm not going to say how many years on, but quite a few years on, here I am. Brilliant stuff. Paul, how did you get involved? Uh, hi, Alison. Hi, everybody. It's great to be part of this today. Um, uh, I guess I'm thinking of my earlier sporting memory when I fully got into sport. I've got a vague recollection of the 66 World Cup final. I don't remember watching it. I just remember being about, I wasn't even four years old, going out and playing football in the street with my friends and lots of my relatives being incredibly happy and people in the area where I lived out in the street. And so I, I was kind of aware something big had happened. My first game probably at Tottenham um, when I was about six years old, um, that's what got me hooked. I was from a family that was half Tottenham, uh, half Arsenal, and uh, one half of the family claimed me. I had flu. I couldn't go to an Arsenal game because I had flu. Uh, and uh, the, the Tottenham supporting part of the family said so it was divine intervention and they stepped in and took me there and, and they got me from that moment on. So that first game at White Hart Lane, I saw uh, Cliff Jones in one of his last games for Spurs and Jimmy Greaves, uh, the great Jimmy Greaves score that day as well. So that's, that's what kind of got me hooked on football. And that was kind of, I still love my cricket and other sports as well, but that was the kind of gateway into, into sport, I guess. Guy? I didn't have any option whatsoever. I, I grew up in a, a detached house, a semi-detached house just outside York, which had a backdrop of a playing field where the local uh, cricket club and football teams played. And my bedroom overlooked that. And I basically spent every waking hour 
from dawn till dusk when I wasn't at school, um, playing football and cricket on that field, absolutely non-stop. We were kicked out of the house in the holidays at 9 a.m. and weren't allowed back in until some food was ready later on. And, and yeah, it's had the added negative effect on me, actually. Of, I hope no opposing bowlers are watching because I'm still trying to play cricket and um, I still can't play off my legs because we used to play with a hard ball on a normal, just you know, uncut pitch. It wasn't a pitch. It was just a strip of grass and um, no pads. As a result, getting my legs out of the way became sort of a prime prime feature of my batting. So I'm still very strong with cover drives through the offside, but anything anything on my legs, and I'm absolutely toast. Um, but, yeah, we, we, we played non-stop. My dad was a, a PE teacher in his youth. He latterly taught other subjects as well. Um, and he had all sorts of stories and memories from, from years gone by. He used to go to all the FA Cup finals when the FA used to distribute tickets to, to schools. So some lucky pupils would go with my dad and my mum as chaperone. Um, and one of the first stories actually I remember was my dad telling me about the 1956 FA Cup final that he was at, Manchester City against Birmingham, the famous one where Bert Troutman broke his neck with about 15 minutes left to play, carried on playing, received his medal from the Queen. Um, I was about five years old, about 1977, when my dad told me this story and my mum backed it up saying she was behind the goal. All she could watch was Bert for the final 15 minutes, wandering about, rubbing his neck, all dazed and everything. And then the backstory to that, German paratrooper, prisoner of war, St. Helens Town, the brilliant film being made recently called The Keeper, all about his life story. And and that kind of, that's boy's own stuff. That's Eagle, that's Shoot, that's Roy of the Rovers all rolled into one. Um, so, so that's been it. That's that's basically the story of why football is, has been my entire life from an early age. I can see you've got a Sunderland shirt behind you. I, we, we talked about this earlier. It is a Sunderland uh, shirt. Is. Uh, does that mean you're a Sunderland supporter? Uh, by default, I have a link with Sunderland. I covered every game for five seasons for local radio up there. Um, so I have a common link with the club, a lot of friends up there. Um, and, and they were the Peter Reid days, which were fantastic because they were up, they were down, they were up, they were down. There, there were some great nights out as well, I have to admit. Um, but now that there's, a, there's another story to that shirt, actually, because I've got that because that was a gift from the club um, because my wife was actually born that very day, the 5th of May, 1973, to a Leeds United supporting dad um, who obviously had, had a bit of a mixed day that day. Um, and, and there's a little secret to that shirt because on the back and the other side of the frame, Eddie Gray has signed it um, to my father-in-law, apologising for, for the result, but congratulating him on the better result that afternoon. Well, BBC reporters, of course, have to be completely unbiased, Ellie. So did you um, have a team to support? Were you a, a supporter of the team or did you always exercise this impartiality for which the BBC is so well known? Well, I, I managed to have reasonable impartiality for quite a long time. Um, but but my brother, my brother was a big Birmingham City fan, my middle brother, and we used to go along. I used to take him. So probably in the kind of late 70s, early 80s, when it was not a particularly pleasant place to go. I and mean, you can imagine that the the, uh, the reputation that Birmingham City fans had in the in those days was was quite well deserved. Um, but um, but I used to go along with with him. Um, we'd, we'd get the train from Hereford where we were living at the time and you know, hide our scarves away, but I, I never, I, I, and then go to the game. And, and I, and that was my first sort of real experience of top flight football, actually, back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, but I never really engaged to the, the extent that I thought, well, Birmingham City are my team. And then I didn't have a team for years and, until I moved to London in 1989 and started going out with somebody who was a obsessive Arsenal fan. So, you know, apologies, Paul, I, I did get claimed by Arsenal <laughs> for, for, for quite a number of years. So so I was I, I wasn't I was there during the, that famous 88-89 um, season when they won the league on Merseyside, as I was repeating to a Liverpool taxi driver just last week. Um, yeah. And and then, you know, the, through the glory years, the George Graham years and the Arsene Wenger years, which were just fantastic. And and I have to say that I've slightly dropped out of going to the Emirates these days, but but some of my f fondest memories of going to Highbury. And actually, I'm, I'm quite proud as well that my I've got two daughters. My elder daughter is a Leicester City fan because her, her dad is a passionate Leicester City fan. And the very first thing he ever gave her, the first present she ever had, was a little tiny Filbert Fox, which she was presented with 
on her in her crib on the day she was born he actually brought it into hospital <laughs> to make sure that she was a Leicester fan and so I thought I thought well I'm claiming my younger daughter to be an Arsenal fan and I think it's fair to say that in the 20 years since then my Leicester supporting daughter has had a much better time of it than my Arsenal supporting daughter. Um, and then to the extent that actually there was, when, when Leicester won the league um, a few years ago, she was in school and some of her, her London football supporting friends said, how come you're a Leicester fan? Are you just supporting them because they've won the league? And so she could justifiably say, no, I've, I've supported them since birth. Um, but I, I mean, the one thing I, I don't get to go to football these day, that much these days, but I, I do I do have a sneaking hope that that the glory days eventually return to to uh, to the Emirates um, under Mikel Arteta or whoever takes over from him eventually. And glory days and Spurs um, possibly slightly further <laughs> it, separated, Paul. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Yeah, it's it, it's it's been a while. It's been a while since. It's funny though. Just coming back to what Ellie was saying there, is the sort of freewheeling nature of sporting memories groups. I guess that one conversation sparks a memory. And it just took me back to my birth of my first son. And um, it, it was just around the launch of the Premier League. And I went along to the press conference when they announced the Premier League and they, they kind of gave us some gifts, including this mitre Premier League football. And I remember sort of taking it back and I think that would be the boy's first football. And he was he didn't put a lot of weight on when he was first born. So I've, got, I've still got this image of him and he's this picture. He's in this Tottenham sort of romper suit. Uh, sitting up, this tiny little thing with this huge football next to him that's almost as big as him. So, so it just completely came back to me as you were talking about uh, the film. The things we but do yeah, to I our mean, children. Uh, this is a, yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's a life sentence. Uh, it's, it's a I beautiful can, deflection. I can beat you there, though, Paul. I don't have to talk about Tottenham being terrible. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I can beat you there, Paul, I'm afraid. In, term, in terms of abject misery, because, I mean, the team that I, I was indoctrinated <laughs> in very early is still languishing in National League North. It is a it is a, a mini Newcastle United, only doesn't get the exposure. We are in desperate trouble. York City, uh, we're, we're awful. We're absolutely rubbish at the moment and have been for many years. Off the field, it's a, it's a complete disaster. On the field, the rare games that I get to go to, I find I have to self-medicate with alcohol before watching the games because it's the only way you can get through them. But the, the, again, memories. Look at this. This is the first match that, I, I remember going to 1979, a trip for my seventh birthday. Look at the number eight for York City there. Look who was number eight. Peter Lorimer. Peter Lorimer. Oh, playing wow. for York Lorimer, City. Lorimer. My first memories of watching football was to see a great like that. I played in that game as well in 73, of course. Um, but a great like that. And, and I, I remember his rocket shots and the stories about them. And, and so, yeah, I was indoctrinated into following the... Uh, the disaster that is the Minstermen at a very early age. So when any Tottenham fans complain to me. <laughs> or Arsenal yeah. fans. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it's all I relative, just couldn't, I couldn't follow a, a, a team at all. My, my, parent, my dad was in the RAF and we got posted to places like Lincoln uh, or Cambridge. And I really tried hard to, to go along. I went to a game at Sinsel Bank. I went to one at the Abbey Stadium. My grandfather came from Torquay. So I went to a game at Plain Moor. Uh, and I really couldn't find a team to be associated with. I did the hero worshipping of Man United in the 60s uh, when I was growing up, sort of 13 or 14, I suppose. Uh, and the only player, a champion, a, a top class football side was when we were stationed in Germany next to near a team called Borussia Mönchengladbach, which is very difficult to pronounce and awfully difficult to chant. So I never really got uh, totally involved in in football i've been to watch bristol city and bristol rovers i've been accused of being a fan of each of them because when you work in the media in bristol yeah you, you're not allowed to be impartial you, you, each side each uh, each fan phones up and says you get you are biased towards bristol city you were biased towards bristol rovers uh, you can't get around it i'm sure you fit you find that that way as broadcasters you can't actually stop being accused by the fans of being biased in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. I mean, Paul, you wear your heart journalist. on the sleeve anyway, don't you? So, so you do, you, you're quite happy to, 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 to chant for Spurs. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite upfront. I mean, I think all of us on the station have kind of decided that, I mean, it just, we can't really hide our colours and yeah, occasionally I try and be fair. I'm probably, it's a bit like the referee when you referee your own kids game, you know, you're harsher on, 
their team than you are you you are on the opposition. And maybe I'm harsher on Tottenham than I'm on Arsenal, believe it or not. But uh, but I, I I don't mind. I think you know coming from a position of knowing who I support might colour what I say on air, but I try not to let it if I if I can help it. <laughs> and when you when you're commentating, guy, do you feel you have to be totally impartial or? Oh. It's 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 like the the not swearing when you're broadcasting rule. Um, it just happens naturally. It, it's completely autopilot. Um, I genuinely, genuinely, hand on heart, the game kicks off and 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 I see one team against another. There is there is one caveat, one exception to that, um, and that is when doing England games. And I'm not going to make any excuses or apologies for that because generally the vast majority, probably eighty ninety percent of people watching, are, are wanting England to win. Um, I do apologise to our Scottish, Welsh and Irish cousins everywhere. But um, I would do the same, by the way, if I, when I'm commentating on other home nations games as well, um, despite the argument to the contrary that we don't. We, we, we do. And, and I don't know anybody who does this job who is any different to that. Over so many years, a bit like a player, players grew up supporting teams, but then they'll have to represent their team against them one day. And you, you just don't think about it. Hopefully we're, we're professional enough to just do a job. And on a weekly basis, I'm accused of supporting actually not support it's probably the other way i'm accused of hating every single team in the premier league so <laughs> there we go. i don't i don't have any ill feeling towards any of them quite frankly even handed to, <laughs> towards them towards them all uh, can i ask you about the best sporting occasion you you w worked at witnessed commentated on ellie where, what about you um well i mean the olympics is very special to me obviously having done well 12 of them now i didn't go to tokyo sadly i would have loved to have been there but i covered it remotely from salford as most of the team did but but having been to so many olympic games um and and going to you know sydney was incredible i loved athens it was mad and beijing was so organized and brilliant and and so much money was thrown at it i loved london london 2012 is is probably my favorite ever sporting occasion partly because i knew how special it was going to be and i'd said to people before you know, because there was all the negative press in the build up to it you know that the transport wasn't going to work and the weather was going to be horrible and nobody was going to want to go so the ticket sales were going to be hopeless and and then in the end they were they were too good too many people wanted to go um but i but i wanted to take go, going back to my, my my girls i wanted to take my daughters along because i knew that when we in 20 in 2007 when we won the bid i knew that they would be 12 and 11. i kind of worked it out at that time and i thought this is the perfect age for them to get caught up in in sport so so that whole experience of doing an olympic games where everyone comes together and the sport is amazing and if you've got tickets to the weightlifting or the water polo it's as good as being in the olympic stadium because of the atmosphere that's created and that feeling of people fulfilling their lifetime dreams that was amazing but but then i suppose the other thing that that stands out i mean two things really from two summers ago summer of 2019 so the world cup final at lords with ben stokes and jofra archer just being incredible and then th that final day at headingley in tw in the ashes when ben stokes achieved probably the most astounding individual performance I have ever witnessed, particularly in a team sport as well. And I think he he won that test match by sheer force of will in lots of ways and just that sense of not wanting to be defeated by anything that was thrown at, at him. And, and that partnership of 72 for the final wicket with Jack Leach, who scored one. And all the drama that went into those those final overs was unforgettable and and i just remember when they needed 11 more because it seemed like such a long way away when when there were nine wickets down and and i thought it's not going to happen it's not going to happen we're going to be talking about an england defeat sometime in the next 20 minutes because your brain tells you that this is what's going to happen <laughs> and then i think with with 10 runs still to get i thought they're going to do this and that was the point when i started to feel nervous and i stood up and just that feeling that my head was going to blow off when when he hammered it for four, and as Jonathan Agnew's commentary said, he hammers it for four, and the whole of the Western Terrace went up. And you can picture Ben Stokes with his with his arms aloft and his bat in the air. And I just I, that was one of my favourite ever moments of, of covering sport, and it just proves how how lucky I am still to be doing it and want to carry on doing it for a good few years yet. And Guy, your favourite moment? 
start just just thinking about that as soon as Eleanor started talking about mm. it it's it, one of those yeah. classic I remember where I was when mm. moments I wasn't at the game but I was I was on holiday actually I, I managed to squeeze a week early football season and I was in Portugal and I was watching it in a hotel bar now I think and Paul can put me right on this I think Spurs were playing at the same time as Ben yeah. Stokes I was about to say guy I was well, yeah. they changed we basically we there was a slight mutiny we kept saying to everybody turn the TVs over onto the cricket on the concourse because it was it was pre kickoff and in the end yeah. Daniel Levy heard and turned all the TVs over onto the cricket and we were still on the concourse for about half an hour and watched that, it that was exactly it I remember in the bar there was just one Tottenham fan wanting to watch the football and everybody else was coming in and gradually words <laughs> spread and the whole poolside <laughs> emptied and everyone came up to watch it mm. oh that was just marvelous I mean non cricket fans were getting so gripped and biting mm. their nails about that you know that mm, was marvelous was I remember I remember I, re I also remember going down to my wife and, and she, she said what happened and she says oh well, I'll, I'll watch the highlights later I said you can't <laughs> you, 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 you've, you've lost the moment it's not going to work mm. with that that's just one way it's not going to work but no I, I, I'm like Alan I've been very lucky to go to to so many sporting event, events around the world and predominantly obviously 99% with me is football and and, and the big tournaments or, or to be honest any World Cup game I've been to ever stands out the Women's World Cup in China in 2007 stands out because it was when the, the, the women's game really really in my mind started to take a hold and really really take a spring forward and, and to be in Shanghai and to, to be over there for that was was outstanding England did pretty well in that as well I think it was the first time we put a women's game live on BBC One as well on a Saturday lunchtime and it did remarkably well and, and, and that was a big moment that, that was a really good trip to go on um, mm. The 98 World Cup, my, my first World Cup final, which was very memorable, France winning, Champs-Élysées afterwards, all that. That was that was almost too much to take in as a as a raw sort of young pup lucky enough to be to be given that job. Um, but but it was great. But there's a moment from that World Cup actually which just sums up the power of sport to me. Um, I was at the game between the USA and Iran in Lyon, uh, which Iran won two one. Um, I'm doing well to remember this because I can't even remember the game I did last week. So this, this one has really played a hold. And again, it's it's what we've been talking about and why sporting memories is is so essential in bringing it out of each other and bringing all these things back and making you, you know where you were when. After the game in a hotel in Lyon, it, it was very, very quiet. And we're just having a drink at the bar. We're having an early flight out the next morning. And I was with Trevor Stephen, the ex-Everton Rangers and England midfielder. And myself and Trevor were joined by an Iranian chap and his son who travelled over to watch the games. Uh, they were drinking the apple teas whilst we're having a, a, a nice Cronenberg or a glass of claret or whatever. And then an American guy who was a, a qualified coach and PE teacher, and he'd come over on his own to watch the games. And over the next, well, until six o'clock in the morning, we didn't even go to bed. We just went straight to the airport and out. It, it, you sort of three cultures combining over football you know, the Iranian guys didn't speak much English the Americans certainly didn't so um, you know it was like all of us coming together and just having this this common goal this common chat about everything and it, we covered everything throughout and, and it was that one thing that brought us together we stayed in touch for a little while after that but that is still an abiding memory of mine it was the first time it really sort of hit home to me just how powerful this thing was that I'd been at and uh, yeah that was great and I still insist that most Americans don't know the first thing about my sport <laughs> That's, that's we've, had, we've had a comment on the website from Richard Wright saying, mentioning that World Cup final with some <laughs> Kiwis in the audience, still raw. I think they've all gone to bed, to be honest. Sorry, uh, Richard. They, they would have done now. Uh, Paul, your, your, your choice memory. Well, I'll prob I would have loved to have said being in Madrid when Tottenham won the Champions League final, but 20-odd <laughs> seconds late and one handball, that was the end of that. So I'll have to... <laughs> Dream on with that one. Probably, again, I, like the guys have been very fortunate to have been at a lot of top sporting events over the years with Talk Sport and, and the magazine I used to edit. And I did a, I got a last minute ticket for the World Cup final in 94 from a friend um, at Adidas, funny enough, and I went over to the final and did a big colour piece for 90 minutes. And it is quite a mind blowing experience to be in a stadium for a World Cup. Final. It was the game in Pasadena. It was a terrible game, as we all know. Sort of nil nil and the Baggio missed penalty. It wasn't. It was one for people who love defending. And um, it just, it was just. It's, I just remember looking around the stadium and it's this searing heat and thinking, there's billions of people around the world watching this and just how lucky I was to, to be in the stadium. But not everybody felt like that. And it feeds into what Guy was just saying because 
there was, we were in a kind of slightly corporate area and there's a lot of people from uh, Gillette and there was a guy who was probably quite senior, a young guy and his uh, girlfriend who was just sitting right in front of us. And he had no concept of football. He wasn't particularly interested in football. He was an American sportsman, but it was a big event and he thought he'd go along. So throughout the game, he'd be turning around and sort of asking me questions. Why did that happen? Why did that happen? Why have they done that? So I was quite happy to help. But with about five minutes left of the game of the 90 minutes, he kind of stood up and said, well, look, it's been really great to meet you. And uh, it's been great talking to you. I said, where are you going? The World Cup final. You can't do that. I wouldn't walk out in the Super Bowl after the third call. You can't do that. He said, no, no. He said, traffic's going to be terrible. I've got to get back into LA. It's pretty much. And I just thought, it's just, if you don't do that, it's a World Cup final. But, you know, that's corporate sport for you, I suppose. But uh, a nice man, but I just an unforgivable thing to do. We're running out of time, unfortunately. I thought we would be able to talk forever. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because of demands of the programme, we could think of, chat up lots of memories. I was going to ask you your favourite person to interview uh, and all sorts of things. But thank you so much, Guy and Paul and Ellie, for for coming along to this special Sporting Memories uh, anniversary. Uh, and good luck in all, in all that you're doing. And we hope to hear from you uh, very soon. But thanks, indeed, thanks so much for your contribution today. We're going to talk to the Sporting Memories founder, Chris Wilkins now, who, um, as we heard before, was there 10 years ago to sign the document over a glass of malt whiskey. Uh, that launched Sporting Memories and has been so special to all of us for so long. So. Uh, I hope that Chris will now be able to bring us up to speed on the future for Sporting Memories. And also after that, we're going to have the questions from that you've written in and sent to the chat room. Uh, and I hope Chris will stay behind. I think Michael is still here uh, and we'll try and answer all your queries. But over to you, Chris. Hi, Alistair. No, no thanks for that. And I, I just can't believe I've got to follow four professional broadcasters now. So I'll, I'll do my best. But it's been fantastic so far and you know that was just like a top class sporting memories group um hearing their memories that was that was fantastic um and it's been quite something looking back at all we've achieved over the last 10 years um but just for i share some of the plans um of going forward i would like to play tribute to, to our staff and volunteers who have supported our work along the way and not least to my co-founder tony who has moved on to pastures new but Really, we could not have got to where we have today without his energy and enthusiasm along the way. Um, but as we look forward, um, it, it feels in many ways like we're still just beginning um, and looking ahead over the next 10 years, there's just so much more for us to do um, to make um, a bigger difference to the lives of more people. Um, but, I, but if I summarize, I think there are four key areas for us going forward. Um, the first, um, is our ambition, and it's been this since day one, is, is really to spread our activities as far as wide as we possibly can. Um, you know, there are, there are several factors which, which certainly are ubiquitous. You know, people's love of sport, and we've seen that today, you know, from New Zealand, first thing this morning, um, I was, I was um, over, involved in the, the launch over there, which was fantastic, um, and seeing Rob on today. Um, personal connections as well, and just how sport reaches across so many people and generations. But the other thing is loneliness. Um, it, I think COVID has really highlighted that, but especially amongst those living with long-term conditions like dementia, um, they're present across the whole of the UK, but across the whole world. Um, so our challenge has been, how do we continue to spread what we're doing? And in the last couple of years, we've developed a new social partnership model, uh, which we've developed as a way to empower other organisations to set up and deliver sporting memories activities in their own communities. And this, ha this has, and I think in the future, will enable us to scale far more quickly while remaining sort of lean and agile ourselves. And we, and we are starting to be approached on a weekly basis by new organisations across the UK wanting to set up their own clubs. And we hope that in 2022, we can establish a presence in Northern Ireland, for instance. But, but seeing our first two clubs in Australia and today the launch of Sorting Memories in New Zealand, we've got confirmation that we are addressing universal issues with a solution that can adapt seamlessly to communities everywhere. And so we'll continue to support and, em and embrace that growth. Um, I think the second challenge um, 
that we've started to address, not least as a consequence of our response to the pandemic, is reaching those individuals who are on the fringes of their communities or so remote or isolated that going to face-to-face -face Sporting Women's Club is just not going to be possible. Um, COVID highlighted to the world how big a challenge of loneliness is. But as some aspects of our lives return to normal, we want to focus on those isolated older people living with long-term conditions for whom there is no return to normal. Um, so building on things like our kit bags, which Mike talked you through earlier, our online clubs, phone circles, and where we've been able to support befriending organisations. We hope in that way we can reach anyone really, um, anywhere in the years ahead, linking people through their love of sport with meaningful connections. So that's happening now, and certainly our immediate efforts are set on developing this further. Um, but we recognise there are still more challenges for us um, with our Comic Relief Funded project at the moment called London Together, um, we're starting to look at how we can embed our activities within minority communities. I mean, we certainly acknowledge as an organisation, um, we're currently, we're not particularly diverse. And while that is something we know we'd like to address, that's going to take time. Um, so even at, to begin working with new com communities, we really need to listen to their voices first and foremost. So um, during the pandemic, we, we turned that particular project um, on its head slightly. Um, and our focus moved to capturing oral histories from people in those communities and recording how sport and games have weaved their way in through their lives. Um, and as part of Black History Month, we've highlighted some of these stories, which will form the very foundations, I think, of how we start to develop our work in this area. And finally, uh, we're conscious that there are many older sports fans living with sensory and cognitive deprivations for whom we really like to develop our activities further. Um, even within our face to face groups, you know, our goal as far as possible is to be fully inclusive and to create a level playing field for everybody. But, um, you know, we, we're looking to embrace technology, for example, to, to take our first tentative steps to seeing how we can use new ways of working and innovation to really tackle um, some of those issues and, and involve people who might have sight impairments or hearing impairments and, and other issues. To, to be fully involved in sporting memories. So they're big ambitions and it's going to take us um, um, many years to get there. So that's why I can see the next 10 years are, are going to be as busy as, as the last 10 years have been. Um, but we don't want these, you know, the innovations, you know, certainly we don't want it to divert us from our core activities and supporting our members and carers um, and, and a wonderful team of volunteers going forward because without them um, none of what we've done in the last year, 10 years would have been possible. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. And yes, let's look forward to the next 10 years. There's lots of things uh, we can do. I'm brimming full of ideas, so I'd love to share with everybody. And there are there are lots of, of, of other like minded people out there who've got so much that they can contribute as well in terms of, of memories and ideas. And once you start sharing ideas and solutions you know it's it, they develop a momentum of their own i, I noticed this when i was involved in um, the blue badge ski which rewarded hotels who made special provisions for people with disability but once you set someone a challenge what can you do the mind the activity the imagination goes wild and they came up with some absolutely fantastic solutions so the the, the challenge the excitement is out there let's all think of ways in which we can make lives better for for all of those affected by dementia and by by isolation and by depression there's so much we can do and it's so exciting to be part of it uh, we're going to have some questions in a minute so i think they're all coming in uh, first of all though we've got another video this time from two of our volunteers in wales paul sawyer and peter owen hi there and Congratulations, Sporting Memories, on 10 wonderful years of uh, success. Yeah, happy birthday. Happy birthday yeah. to everyone in Sporting Memories. We're yeah. from the Vale of Morgan Club, which is a fairly new club um, based around the towns of Barry and Penarth, quite near Cardiff. And uh, we're fairly new volunteers. We've been doing this for about 18 months About 18 now. months, yeah. but we're just getting started planning our first physical meeting because obviously in the middle of COVID. So yeah. 
when we start the first meeting, Peter has agreed to dress up as um, Jane Torville or... Well, you cannot be serious. <laughs> uh, but no, we're, we're very grateful for the support we've had from, from uh, Nikki and the other staff and uh, we're really looking forward to uh, the post-Covid era. Yes, we are. And um, we've, we can't wait to have the first meeting and to, um, to meet all of the people that we've only seen virtually, hopefully, um, in a physical presence very soon. Yeah, the Elkham Valley Hour and Sporting Memories. Thanks very much, Peter and Paul. Now let's the questions. Uh, from James, I'm really impressed with your work. Do you have any resources to support carers? So uh, that's probably one for Chris, is it? Yes, yeah, certainly um, um, during COVID, I think especially we recognised that lots of people were isolated in, in their own homes. And and so what we did is we have made the, the Sporting Pink, which is our um, sort of weekly uh, reminiscence newspaper, that's av available to freely download so on the website there's a link there that that could be downloaded and, and printed off and used to sort of support reminiscence um, the kit bags that we've shown um, they can be purchased actually through our online shop um, and and hopefully you know there, there could potentially be zoom groups that um, that people could join as well so that's about looking on the website and seeing where things might be in their area so certainly you know for carers to to get involved in that way initially that would um, that would be great and a question for Michael. Where can we access Michael Clark's research papers? They'd be very interested to read these. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure I ought to be recommending this. I'm not sure they're the best papers in the world, but uh, thanks for the comment. And uh, if you, if, uh, most of the papers, I think, are on uh, journal websites that are a bit obscure. Uh, but if you, if you Google my name and LSE, London School of Economics, you, you should be able to find a, a profile of me on there that I think has, has copies of those papers on that profile and, and some of the stuff that I've done. But uh, uh, it, don't blame me when you start to read them. Fantastic. The kit bag project sounds really great. This is another anonymous question. Is it more widely available now? Yes. Certainly. To individuals, they, they can be obtained on our on our website. And I have to say, I apologize, we, we are having some problems with our website today, ironically. I say, I don't know whether it's because it's particularly busy, but uh, so if you can bear with us, there are details on the website about the, the kit bag. And just looking at um, the next question as well about our groups, also there, um, there are interactive maps to be able to locate where our sporting memories groups are uh, across the country as well, for people you know living with dementia. Yeah, and it's incredibly exciting to be to be part of a group. Certainly, I was involved in the start in helping start the Brighton group, and you know the people you bring in, the people that that come and show an interest, and it's it really is. We started with a few, we're going bigger. Our neighbours in Hove are doing the same sort of thing, and there's a lot about word word of mouth. It's a lot about people like the Admiral Nurse uh, that has joined us on this chat, just spreading the word and finding people who would be interested uh, in joining and being part of the group and sharing that that conversation, that reminiscing, that joy and the fun of sport. Uh, I remember at the last conference a, a year ago, I mentioned my dad. My dad was a, a great sportsman in his own right, but his last seven years or so, he was gradually more and more afflicted by dementia. And the only thing that really brought him back to us and lit up the whole conversation was when we talked about sport. He knew he loved sport and he loved watching on the telly, but he loved talking about his experiences, his joy, all of those things. And that really brought him back to us. Our dad came back to us. And I know so many other people for whom that is a similar, uh, a similar experience that, you know, when you get reminiscing about something you love or something that's been part of your life, part of the fabric of your life, you grow up watching sport, watching, playing, supporting commenting about sport it's part of your life so when something triggers it really seems and i don't know the medical ins and outs but it does trigger something in in the in the brain that allows much much more freedom of association more conversation more confidence in my dad's case before he was a bit reluctant to involved in conversations because he kept forgetting the words for it but if you get him talking about sport it was you know as i say like a light bulb going on and that was so important to us. I've got another comment from Angie this time. Happy birthday from the Warrington Walls Foundation. 
we enjoy and have benefited from working with you. The growth and variety in community ventures has been huge, which, you know, is, is a great commendation, isn't it, Chris? No, absolutely. So it's, it's lovely to hear from, from one of our partners. And uh, as I was saying, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, we, we can only grow as well through new partnerships. It, it is about collaboration. Um, and so we, I know we're going to have an interactive session after the, the conference itself, where if organisations want to know how they might be able to set up their own sporting memories clubs as well. You know, I think we've created a vehicle now to enable that to happen. But uh, you know, there are wonderful stories from from lots of our partners across the UK and, and out further afield. So no, that's that's great to hear from Angie on that. Yes, thank you for reminding me. There, there is a breakout uh, networking session after this conference is over. We're going to finish about 12 o'clock and then at about quarter past, we're going to open up again. And those people particularly interested in how we can spread the message, particularly to people who are either isolated or uh, can't get, can't access the, the groups themselves or, or the, these ethnic minorities that we were talking about earlier. So that's that's an important thing if you're interested in that the, the conference workshop should start at about quarter past we're coming towards the end of the project of the conference now so let's have a bit more fun with the word cloud we asked people what sporting memories meant to them i don't know if we've had some what word describes sporting memories what have we had summer so far Well, what does it mean to you? Um, what do sporting memories mean to me? Joy, community, inspirational, those words come up, certainly. Happiness, community, special, family. Yeah, it's history, tradition, togetherness. Yeah, all of those things. We, we have a wonderful time in in our group, I, I can't speak for all the others, although I have attended Hove's group, um, just chatting, just remembering, and things spark off from each other, togetherness, uh, sharing, all of those things, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful environment to be in where you can listen to somebody else, and that gives you a memory, and that talks about something else, and, and reminds you of things you'd forgotten about, uh, and it sparks off on something else, it's a really wonderful Thing, the noise and the energy as mentioned there it's terrific that there is so much fun so much joy and that's the beauty of sport for all that you know you've got your hooligans and you've got your different problems and your scandals and so for most of us it's about joy and friendship and fun and and happiness and and certainly remembering those things bringing back and sharing them with other people is just a joyful experience so really really uh, special sporting memories as we come to the end of this session this particular session and nearing the end of this very special 10th anniversary birthday party for sporting memory so i'd just like to take this opportunity to finish by thanking all the speakers for giving their time their expertise and their insights so generously wasn't it great to hear from catherine granger and rob Wedder, and of course from paul and ellie and guy absolutely brilliant thanks to all the members and volunteers and partners who've sent your messages and have contributed and joined in this session thanks to the audience for joining us thanks to av matrix brilliant technology uh, for hosting this event and especially to drew who has been the absolute mastermind controller in the background there brilliant stuff uh, thanks to the sporting memories team who've worked so hard thanks to everybody involved sporting memories is only equal to the sum of his parts but we have got one more video message this from george cumming the former fifa head of refereeing and the sporting memories volunteer in motherwell happy birthday from the members the volunteers and the staff at ravenscourt shelter complex in motherwell all the best and that's it finally if you'd like to support sporting memories you can do so by texting SMF to 70085 to donate five pounds. Texts will cost the donation amount plus one standard network rate message. You can do this as many times as you like. Thank you so much. If anyone would like to join the networking session, please follow the Zoom link that was sent out yesterday. And thank you all once again 
for taking part. This is Alastair Hignall saying bye for now.